Hello and welcome, I'm your Code Monkey, and here let's learn how to use the new input system. This video is pretty big, but it's the only video you need in order to learn how to use the new input system. This is an excellent package that makes managing multiple inputs of different types very easy. It looks a bit daunting at first, but once you understand how it works, then it becomes actually quite easy to work with. And of course, the benefits of this system are immense. Once you have everything set up and your game working with the actions that you defined, after that's done, then your game is instantly playable with the mouse and keyboard, or touch input, or maybe an Xbox or PlayStation controller. All of that works seamlessly. Also, this video is a lecture taken from my Ultimate Unity Overview course. Unity is massive, so in the course I explain over 40 features and tools of the engine that you might not know about. There's individual lectures explaining tons of things like shader graph, assembly definitions, pro builder, the video player, and so on. Also, the course will be continuously updated with free updates as I add more lectures explaining more tools and features. This specific lecture was added as a part of the first free update along with 10 other new lectures. So go ahead, get the full course, and learn how to master all of the Unity tools to help you make better games faster. In this lecture, we're going to learn all about the new input system package. This is a lot more capable than the legacy input manager, and it easily allows you to handle input from multiple sources without any issues. So you can make your games work with a mouse and keyboard, or an Xbox gamepad, or a PlayStation controller, and all of it works seamlessly. But naturally, all of those awesome features come at the cost of slightly more complexity. However, once you understand how it's all set up, what is an action, what is an input, and so on, once you understand the basics of the system, it's actually quite simple to use. Okay, so let's learn how it works. First up, we need to install it by going into the package manager. Make sure you're on the Unity registry, then scroll down and find the input system package. Then just go ahead and install it. And also over here, you've got a whole bunch of samples that you can download to inspect if you want to see how they all work. So these are some very specific scenarios, so maybe they can be helpful. Now, when you install, you might see a message talking about enabling the new input system or the old input manager. You've got two options. You can click on yes, which will disable the old input manager and enable the new input system or you can click on no so nothing changes. Instead of using that window, you can instead go into edit and go down here into project settings, then go onto the player tab and then down here, scroll, expand the other settings, scroll down here until you see the active input handling. And over here, you can select the old one, the new one, or you can select both of them. Now I covered the differences between both of them in another lecture, so go watch that if you haven't seen it yet. But essentially I find that they both have their use cases, so here I just pick both. And when you change this, it restarts the Unity editor. Okay, now to start actually using the new input system, the first thing you need is to create an input actions asset. This is an actual asset in your project files. So you just right click on some folder, go into create, and then scroll down here until you find the input actions. So create it, give it a name like player input actions, and then double click on it. So when you do, out pops out the input actions window. Now, this is where you're going to define all of the actions and inputs that you can then use in your game. So you see this separated in three groups. You've got action maps, actions, and properties. Now, let's add an action map by clicking over here on the plus icon. So an action map is how you organize various actions. For example, if you had a game where you have a player that can walk around the world, but also enter vehicles, you would make one action map for the player walking, another one for the vehicle inputs, maybe yet another one for the UI for while the game is paused, and so on. So using multiple action maps really helps keep things nice and organized by having distinct action maps instead of just a huge list of actions. So let's call this one just the normal player. Next up are the individual actions. So this is what actions your game can take, like for example, move or shoot. So for example, let's name this simple action, just jump. Then over here on the properties, you can see the action type. So it's a drop down menu you can select from value button and pass through. Now value is for continuous inputs. So something like movement being controlled by a joystick would be a value type. Button is like the name implies for things that work like buttons. So something where you press and release. Then pass through is similar to value, but it bypasses something called disambiguation, which is a process through which the input system decides which input is active. But for now, don't worry about that. Let's just focus on value and button. Now this is a jump action, so let's make it a button. Then we have interactions. This is the various ways that we can interact with an action of this type. So for a button, you've got the hold, multi-tab press, and so on. If you just want a basic button press, then you don't need to add anything. That's the default. And finally, processors. So this is how you can apply some processing to this specific action itself. This is more useful for when dealing with joystick inputs, for adding a dead zone, and so on, but we'll see that in a bit. 
Okay, so when you create a new action, it also creates the new binding. If it didn't, you can just right click and add a binding. So the binding, this is the actual physical input that we want to tie into this action. Then for selecting the physical input, you can click on this drop down menu and manually select it. So go into the gamepad and over here you see all of the various buttons that you can map. Alternatively, for more advanced use case, you can turn this into a text box and over here type in the actual button. This is a special syntax used by the input system. So again, for now, don't worry about that. Let's keep things simple. And the simplest of all is just to click on this button that's named listen. So when you click, now you can press any key you want. So in my case for jump, let's press the space bar. And there you go, that one listens to the space bar on the keyboard and just select it. All right, so with that, we have the most basic input asset done. We made the player action map. Inside, we defined a jump action. We made it so that it works like a button and we bound that action to the physical spacebar input. Now let's see how to actually use this to jump an object. And also one very important thing that you cannot forget is to actually save this asset. So up here you've got a button for save asset and up here on the title for this window you can see a little asterisk. This means that there are unsaved changes. So when you see that, make sure you save it. And also up here on the right side you have a toggle where you can enable to autosave. So the reason why this is a toggle and not simply enabled all the time is because of the C-sharp class generation, which we're going to see in a bit. But until we do, we can turn this on and make things simpler. Okay, so now that we have over here our actions working, in order to use them, the simplest way is with a pre-built component. So I've got my testing scene here. I essentially just got a floor and then I've got a basic sphere object. So I want to jump the sphere. And now over here, let's add a component and let's search for player input. So this is a built-in component that is really useful for working with the new input system. Over here, you can see it takes an input action asset. So just drag the one that we created, there it is. Then we've got the default map. Right now we just have one, so let's default to that one. Then we've got some more advanced use cases for dealing with the UI, camera, and so on. So just leave these at none. And then you've got the behavior. So this is how the actual notifications of each action are sent. And over here, you've got various methods you can use. So first of all, you've got send messages, which uses the Unity send message system. So it triggers functions with these names on any script attached to this game object. Then the next one is broadcast messages. This one is similar to send message, except that it also triggers functions on any child objects. But most of the time you should use one of the other two. So either Unity events, which you may already be familiar with, or basic C Sharp events. So let's see the Unity events. Now here we get an events tab that we can expand to see all of the various events that this object will fire. So by default, we've got these three. So when it's triggered, when a device is lost, for example, a gamepad gets disconnected. Regain, so the gamepad gets connected again. Or controls change, so for example, you swap from the keyboard to the gamepad. So these are normally Unity events, so you can click on the plus icon, select an object and the function to trigger them. And then up here, you've got the player, so that's the specific action map that we created. And up here we've got the jump. So this is the event that we made, the actual action. So this is where we can trigger something. So let's make a script that we can then feed into here in order to have our event. So up here I'm just going to make a basic C Sharp script. Call it testing input system. And here let's attach it to this game object. Okay. Now in here let's just make a very simple function. So let's make a public void jump. And on jump let's just do a debug.log jump. Okay, just very basic. And for the object, let's drag this game object as the object. And for the function, let's go down to the testing input system and the jump function. Okay, so like this, let's test. So here I am, and as I press the spacebar, yep, there you go, I've got the log. All right, it does work. Now let's just make the rigid body jump upwards. So just for fun. Okay, so just like this, just add force upward just to make the sphere jump. So here, and as I press the spacebar, yep, there you go, the sphere jumps. All right, so far so good. Now, however, there's one interesting thing that you might notice, which is even though I press the spacebar just once, over here we actually see three logs. Now, the reason for that has to do with the various phases that the input system goes through. So it's essentially one log for when the button was pressed, another one for the button is currently pressed, and finally for the button release. If we expand the event, we can see that this event can be called with a parameter of type callback context. This is the type that contains more data on specifically how the button was pressed. So let's modify our function to also include this parameter. 
So back in our script, let's add using unity engine dot input system. And then we can modify this one. And we're going to receive of type input action dot callback context. Then of course, if you want, you can just right click, go to the definition and inspect all the source codes, all the various things that this one does. But over here, let's just see the actual phase. So let's add into the log the context dot phase. And back in the editor, since we modify the function, let's assign it again. So once again, the jump function, there you go. So let's test. Okay, so here, and as I press the space bar, and if there you go, you can see the various stages it goes through. So the start, so that's as soon as I press, performed, so that's I'm currently pressing it, and canceled, which is when I release. So these are the three separate stages that the input system goes through. So for example, for a button, chances are you really only want it to be triggered once when the button is pressed. So you can use the performed event. You can either test if the phase equals phase.performed, or you can just go if context.performed. So this is a simple boolean that simply returns true if it is in the performed phase. So if on the performed, then you do this. Okay, so like this. So here I am and I jump and there you go. It jumps much less because it's only being applied the force once and you can see that we just have one log. All right, awesome. So that's one way to make it work by using our input unity events. But then like we saw, the other method is using C sharp events. So let's see how this one works. So any click, these are C sharp events, so they are not visible in here in the editor. So the way you subscribe is like any other C sharp event, so it's through code. So first of all, let's get our component. So private, it's of type player input. Okay, so we get that one. And then through there, we can see all of the various events that it has. So it's got the default ones that we saw a while ago. So on device lost, regained, and on controls changed. And then for the various actions, you've got this one on action trigger. So regardless of how many action maps you've got, you've just got this event. So as you might imagine, the one big difference is that this one is triggered for all actions on all action maps. Now, right now we just defined one action, but if we had more then any action input, we'd fire this one event. So let's simply subscribe to this one. And as you can see, this one takes a parameter of type callback context. So when we get the context, let's just do a debug.log on the context just to see what this is doing. Okay, so let's test. Okay, so here I am, and as I press the spacebar, and if there you go, now I can see the various contexts. So I can see the action is in the action map player. It's the jump action. It was triggered by the keyboard space. Then for the phase, this one is the start, and it happened on the time of 5.9 seconds. And once again, the key, keyboard space, with a value of one and no interaction. So you've got the start phase, the perform phase, and the canceled phase. So in order to use this method, then you do some identification over here on the action field. And depending on what action it fired, then you do different things. But if we're going with this method of using this built-in player input class, then I think it makes more sense to use unity events for this one. So again, you can use both, but here I'm going to switch back. So just like this and make sure that on jump event, it triggers the jump action. Okay, so now it's a good time to look into action interactions. So back in our input manager, we've got the jump action over there. It's of action type button. Okay, and we've got the interaction. So let's add one. Let's, for example, look at the hold interaction. Then if you want, you can set how long. So how much time do you have to hold the button before it's actually triggered as a hold event? So you can use the default. So just tick this box or untick and set anything that you want. And like this message says, you can click over here to open the input settings. So this opens up the project settings and goes over here to the input system package. And you can then create a settings asset and modify all the defaults. So let's test just with the default, so just the hold. Once again, don't forget to save just in case you have autosave disabled. And back here, we are not using C sharp events. So let's just clean up the code, just get rid of this so it's easier to understand. And over here on the jump, let's actually do a debug.log on the entire context. Okay, so we had the hold interaction. Now let's see just how often this function will be called. So here I am, and if I just quickly press, Yep, we can see we've got the started and the canceled phase, but we did not get the performed phase. That is because we did not hold on for long enough. And the sphere itself did not jump because it only jumps on the performed phase. So if I click and I hold, after half a second, then it does do the performed. And now as I let go, now it does the cancel. So as you can see, the interactions are super useful for making some more complex actions. And again, remember that everything that we're doing here we're making it work with the keyboard, but if we add another binding, it would also work with the gamepad or touch or anything else. And also this is a list, so you can have multiple interactions. So you could have a hold, then a slow tap, and so on. Although ideally, chances are you would make them into separate actions. 
Okay, so that's interactions, and then you've got the processors. Like I said, these aren't really very useful for buttons, but you can, for example, add an invert processor. And right now, before we hit play and clear the console, we can see that as we were pressing, we were getting over here the value of 1. So on the start and perform, we've got a value of 1, and then on cancel, we got a value of 0. Now if we add the invert processor, so now as I click, and if there you go, now instead of plus 1, we get minus 1. So these processors apply some sort of processing on top of the actual event. This is going to be more useful as we get into the movement joysticks, but we'll see that in a bit. Okay, so with this, we have covered the absolute basics. And we also saw how the built-in player input component works. But like I said previously, you also have the ability to generate a C-sharp class and have a lot more control over it. So let's go into the project window and over here select the actual input actions asset. Then you got a button to edit the asset which opens up this window and then you've got a toggle for the generate C-sharp class. So you can take this one and then you see all of these inputs. So if you want, you can modify what file they're going to be generated in, what class name, what namespace and so on. But here, just leave them as defaults and hit on apply. So as you do, you can see over here that it generated the C-sharp file. So over here, the player input actions. Now, if you want, you can open and inspect this. It just generates all kinds of functions, fields, and events based on the input action. So for example, we define the player action map. And over here, we can see the player action map right in here. And then for the player, we define some actions. So we define the jump action. So over here, we can see an interface that implements the jump action. And over here, the player actions. So all of this code is all dynamically generated. So we've got our jump action and the various events started, performed, and canceled. So you really don't need to worry about how this script works, but if you want to, feel free to inspect it. So back in our testing input system, here in order to use that, we just need to create an instance of our generated C# -sharp class. So it's called player input actions. So new player input actions. So just construct this object. And then on this one, we need to access the player action map. And then we're going to access the jump action. And finally, we're going to subscribe to the performed event. So just plus equals and subscribe to this one. And there you go, the signature is exactly the same. So on jump performed, you've got a comeback context. And then over here, you can do anything. So let's use this exact same function instead of creating a new one. So just like this, let's see if this works. And just up here right now, we're no longer using the player input. So let's actually remove this component. So we're just going directly through the C-sharp class. So let's try. Here I am, and as I hit space, and nope, nothing happens. Now that is because we need to make sure to enable this input action. So by default, when you construct, it's actually disabled, so it's not actually listening to input. So in order to enable it, we actually have various ways we can do that. We can go directly into the player input actions and call enable. However, if you do it like this, it will actually enable all of the various action maps. So if you had one for the player, one for a vehicle, one for the UI, all of them would be active at once, which is probably not what you want to do. So instead of enabling the entire input actions asset, you can just go into the player. So just go into this action map and just enable just this one. And now here, if I hit space, if there you go, everything works. So I've got the performed action and it triggered the jump and it jumped the rigid body upwards. And again, note how here we only have one log that is because since we're going through this one, we are only subscribing to the performed event. So if we wanted, of course, we could also subscribe to the started or the canceled event. But chances are we just want to perform, so this is actually much better. Okay, with this working, now let's add some more actions. So on the input action asset, let's add another action. So we click on the plus button here. Let's name this one movement. And now here is the reason why there's a toggle for the autosave, which is because of the c -sharp class generation. If you have the generation enabled and you change this one tiny thing, so for example over here, change from button into value, as soon as I change, then you can see down there that Unity is compiling, so everything is frozen, I gotta wait a bit, and so on. So if you do have C -sharp generation enabled, then it makes sense to disable it, do all your changes, then save, and when you save, then it does generate the C -sharp class. Okay, so this is our movement action. Then over here for the action type, this is not a button, so we're going to use value. And then you can see a field for the control type, so this is if you want to limit it to a specific type, like for example, only allow the D-pad or analog inputs or anything, or you can also go with any if you're not entirely sure. But in this case, we do know that we want movement, which means that we want an X and Y axis. So let's go with a simple vector two. And then let's also delete the default binding that was created automatically. So just right click over here, click on delete. And instead, let's click on this plus icon. Instead of adding a normal binding, let's add a 2D vector composite. So with this, we get four directions. So up, down, left, right. 
So this makes it perfect for binding to something like the arrow keys or W, A, S, and D. So I'm going to do that, so just select this binding, then over here on the path, click on this one, click on listen, this one is up, so press on the W key, there you go, W, then down, go over here, press on S, then left, let's go into A, and finally the right, let's go into D. All right, W, S, A, D. So again, don't forget, click on the save asset. So now it's going to regenerate the C sharp class. And now once again, you can either go through the player input component or access the C sharp class directly. So let's use that method since we're already using it here. So for that one, let's go into the player input actions. Then we're going to go into the player action map. And now the action is named movement and let's subscribe to the performed event. Okay, so when that happens, let's just do a debug.log on the context. Okay, so let's test like this and see what the context contains. So here, and I'm going to press the W key, and yep, as soon as I do, you can see that happened. So you can see the context triggered on the player action map on the movement action, which has all of these bindings, so W, A, S, and D. This was a performed phase on this time, and if you look a bit further, you can see over here the value. We've got a value of 0.0, .0 and then 1.0. So I press on W, so that means I've got a one on the Y. Then if I press on the S, I've got 0 minus 1, if I press on A, I've got minus 1, 0, press on D, and I've got plus 1, 0. So we've got the perfect vector 2 in order to actually move our sphere. So let's use that to move our rigid body. So up here on the context, in order to read the actual value, let's go into context, and then you call the function read value, and this one takes a generic for the actual type. Here we have a two-dimensional array, so let's read it as a vector 2. And now in this case, this is the movement direction that we want to apply to the rigid body. Okay, so here we're doing context out read value, reading a vector two, so this is going to be our input vector. Then I'm just doing a sphere rigid body in order to add a force. Then for the force, I'm constructing a vector three because the sphere is in 3D and the input vector is in 2D. So just making that using the input vector X, then zero on the Y, since I don't want to move the sphere upwards, but rather back and forward. So just put that one, multiply it by a certain speed and so on. Okay, so let's test like this. So here I am, and as I press on W, and if there you go, it did move the sphere. However, you can see that it moved by a tiny amount. So now I press on S and goes backwards. And now I press on D and goes to the right, press on A and so on. So the one thing that you do notice is that this input gets only triggered once. So it's essentially on a button press. So if I want to actually move the sphere, I've got to spam the buttons. That's not supposed to be like that. Ideally for a movement input, it makes more sense to constantly check the current state and constantly apply it. So for that, we can go with another method. Instead of over here subscribing to the performed on the movement action, we can make a very simple private void update. And over here, we can actually read the value on every frame. So we can go into player input actions. So that means that we need to make this as a member field. So you go into that one, access the player action map, access the movement action. And then over here, we can call read value, read as a vector two and so on. So the same thing that we're doing here, let's do it up there. Okay, so the exact same thing, except on the update, we're going through the player input actions, player movement, and so on, and then applying the force and everything should work. So now let's see. So now as I press and hold, and yep, there you go, now movement is indeed being applied on every frame. Let me just lower the speed. And since this is a rigid body, we should probably do this on fixed update. And yep, now in here, I can indeed use W, A, S, and D in order to actually move my sphere. So move it to the right, move it upwards, then start moving downwards and so on. All right, so now it's working and I'm reading the value on every single update. So chances are for movement, you want to go with this method instead of the event method. Okay, so now it's probably time to look into how multiple inputs like keyboards and gamepads work. Over here on the input action asset, if you go on the top left corner, over here you've got a button where you can add a bunch of control schemes. So let's add one. Let's call this the keyboard. And over here on the list you select the type. So let's select the type keyboard and hit on save. 
Then here for each individual binding, you can go ahead and over here tick and make sure that this one is used in the keyboard control scheme. So just select that one in there. Then over here for all of these, select them one by one. Okay, so now all of these bindings are set as keyboard bindings. And now we can go up here, create a new control scheme, name this one gamepad. And on the list, let's select a gamepad, select a generic gamepad, and just hit on save. And when you do, you can see that the bindings disappear. Now, if you want, of course, they're not lost, so you can go back into the keyboard and you can see the keyboard bindings, then go into the gamepad, and over here, we're going to add gamepad bindings. So right now, I just connected my Xbox controller, and you can also see over here on the logs that the input system automatically detected that that one was connected. So with this, let's do just like we did. So on the jump, let's click on this. We're going to add a binding. Then for this binding, go into the path and listen, and now I'm going to press a button on my Xbox controller. So I'm going to press the A button, However, if you try this, it might not be working. That is because I connected the gamepad right while the game was running. So to solve that, just make sure you save the asset and just play the scene. And then if you quit again, now it should be identified. So now I can go up here, click on listen, press on the A button, and there you go, it does connect. In order to validate that everything was connected, there's actually one that is super useful that I'm going to talk about in a bit. But just here briefly, you can go over here into window, analysis, input debugger, and over here, you should be able to see your controller connected. Okay, so anyways, click on listen, click on the A button. And over here, you see an interesting thing about the input system. If you want, you can select the A button on the Xbox controller. So if you do that, then this action will only be triggered by the Xbox A button, meaning that pressing X on a PlayStation controller will not trigger this action. So the better approach you can take is just use this one, just button south gamepad. This is a generic control that won't work on any gamepad. So you've got button south, north, east, and west. And with that, if you select this one, so button south gamepad, so the generic one, if you select this one, then it will trigger on an Xbox A button or on a PlayStation X button or on a Switch A button and anything else that has the standard inputs. Okay, so that's the simple button input, okay. And then over here for the movement, let's click on this button. And now for the keyboard, we made a 2D vector composite. That's because it was based on four buttons. But for the gamepad, we really just want to use a joystick. So let's use a normal binding. And then over here for the path, just click on listen. Now I'm going to move around the left stick and it automatically identifies. So once again, you can go with the Xbox controller or the more generic gamepad. All right, so that's it. And now just with this, we can see the true power of the input system, which is we do not need to touch our code at all. The code is already set up to work with the jump action and the movement action, regardless of whatever physical input they come from. So just with this, if I click on save asset and I play the game, now I can, for example, press space on the keyboard in order to jump. And now without doing anything special, I'm just going to press the A button on my Xbox controller. And yep, there you go, it does trigger the jump, now using the gamepad. So here, this is the example of the awesome power of the new input system. So it allows you to completely separate actions from the physical inputs. You write your code to work simply with actions, and then you set up the input action asset with how those actions are triggered. And then without doing anything else, your game now works perfectly with any input. So the player can seamlessly switch between keyboard or gamepad and anything else, and everything works perfect. All right, awesome. Okay, so with that, you already know the basics, but let's see a few more things. For example, like I said, the processors, they are super useful when it comes to gamepads. And by the way, here, since we actually have two control schemes, we can add processors on the action itself. So click on the action and add a processor. This will apply to the action regardless of whatever control scheme you're using, or you can just add the processor directly on the actual binding. So this is useful if you want to apply a processor to the gamepad, but not on the keyboard. So then over here, one of the more useful ones is over here, the stick dead zone. This helps when gamepads have slight issues and they aren't perfectly on zero zero. So for example, you've heard of the Nintendo Joy-Con Drift. That is where the actual physical joystick gets slightly moved to the side, never actually goes down to zero, zero. So that is why you have the stick dead zone. So with this processor, what it does is if you move the stick by less than this amount, then it won't be considered zero, so you won't do anything. And if you move it by more than this amount, then it won't be considered one. And also the value between these two is normalized. So for example, if I take away this one and I put the minimum at 0.5, so now it should only read a value of more than zero after I move the stick more than halfwards towards any direction. So over here, I am physically moving the stick and as you can see, nothing on the console, so it's not listening. And once I get past the halfway point, so just a bit more and there you go, it does start to actually move. 
let's add a log so we can see the actual values. So up here, let's do a debug.log on the input vector to see what this says. So over there, it's all at zero. And as I move a bit, and it's still at zero, and only once I go past 0.5, then it actually reads the value 0.1. So like I said, this is normalized. So as soon as I move past the half, now it starts reading the value. And if I go way past to the side, so if I go past the 0.975, then it reads as an actual one. So that's what the processors do. As you can see, adding the stick dead zones to gamepad six is something you should always do so your players can play the game, even if their gamepad isn't in perfect condition. And just as another quick example, for example, you've got the normalized vector two. So as you saw, if I move the stick by a tiny bit, then it only shows like 0.1. But if I add the normalize, and now as I move just one tiny bit, you can see the values are normalized. So even if I move just a tiny bit, the magnitude of the actual input vector always goes up to magnitude of one. Okay, so now it's time to talk about the thing that I mentioned a while ago, which is for the input action, you've got value button and then pass through. Now pass through is similar to value, but it bypasses something called the disambiguation, which is the process through which the input system decides which input is active. Now, like I said, the input system handles all of the complex logic when you have multiple inputs connected, like for example, multiple gamepads. And when using value, it will only trigger the action for the active gamepad, whereas on pass-through, it will trigger the action for every single gamepad. So now I also have a PlayStation controller connected, and if I move one, you can see on the log that it does change, but then it goes back into zero and so on. That is because right now it is receiving input from multiple controllers. So I'm just moving one controller and not the other one, and the input, as you can see, it's very erratic. So the issue is because receiving inputs from all of the various controllers. So for example, one of them is telling them to go right, the other one left, and so on. So the whole thing gets all messed up. Whereas if I set this back into value, and over here, if I'm moving using the Xbox controller, yep, now the log is actually correct. So it's only listening to input from the Xbox controller. And now if I instead start moving the PlayStation controller, now it's listening to input from that one. So now it only listens to you once at a time. So only the one that is active gets listened, all of the other ones get essentially ignored. So pass-through is useful for if for some reason you want to read input from every device at once, but for the most part, you really want to use value. Now, so far we've been playing with an input action that we created from scratch. However, if you want to quickly get it up and running, you can also use the default. So if you go onto a game object and then add the player input component, if you do not assign anything here and instead you click on this button, then it asks you for a path, so you can save it, and it automatically creates the default input actions asset. So this one is pre-filled with a bunch of action maps and a whole bunch of actions. So if you want, you can use this as a starting point instead of building your own from scratch, or you can just look at this one to inspect and see how they implement things. So this one has got all kinds of control schemes, the two action maps, all kinds of actions, and so on. Now, on the lecture where I cover the differences between the input manager and the input system, I said that the input manager is just more simple and more compact in general. While that is true, the input system can also be very compact if you want it. So for example, just testing for a simple mouse click, you can do a private void update, and on update, you can do go inside the mouse, access the current active mouse, go into the left button, and then check was press this frame. If so, then with this, you've got a simple test testing if the mouse is pressed. Then you can also test for specific gamepads. So you access the gamepad class, you access the current one, then you can access all the various buttons. So A, B, button north, south, and so on. You can also go into the keyboard and access the current, then access, for example, the T key, and so on. But do remember that this super compact method is something you should really only use for a very quick test or prototyping something new. When building something more permanent, you should absolutely be using the actions and not be working directly with specific buttons at all. One more thing here in the code is with regards to multiple action maps. So as an example, let's create one to see how it works. So first of all, go up here, create a new action map. Let's say this is the UI. So we want a bunch of inputs for navigating through our UI. And up here, let's just add a single action. So just submit. So just clicking a button. And then for the binding, let's just bind it directly into the spacebar. So since it's bound to the spacebar, which also on the player, it's also bound to the spacebar. So the player has got to jump to the spacebar and the UI has the spacebar doing a submit. Now, how do you tell which action map should be active? If you're using the player input action, first of all, let's make a function for the actual UI submit. So over here, you've got the various action maps. So you expand upon this and set it. 
So here, let's just copy this one, do the same thing. Except this one, call it submit. Okay, and now here, let's just hook onto that event. Okay, so we got both events, both of them triggered by the same physical button, but they are on different action maps. So over here on the player input itself, you can see the default map, so this is the starting one. So the you start on the player or the UI or so on. And now how you change them is over here through code, you've got the player input, so you get the component and so on. And then you trigger the function switch current action map. You do that and then you pass in the map name or the ID. So let's use this super compact testing that I mentioned previously. And instead of the mouse, let's go with the keyboard. So if I press the T key, we're going to swap the player input to the action map UI. And if I press the Y key, we're going to swap it back into the player action map. And then by pressing space, we should see either this function or this function. So let's see. Okay, so here I am and as I press space, and yep, it's firing the jump action on the player action map. Now I press T to swap out the actual default map. And I press space again, and yep, now it's instead firing the submit action. Now I press Y to go back into the player and so on and down. So yep, this is the function that you trigger in order to swap between each action map. So for example, if you had a UI that was only meant for the pause button, then when the player hit on pause, then you would call this, and when the player hit on resume, you would go with this one. So this is when working with the player input built-in component, and when working with the C-sharp plus, very simple. Like we saw, it only works if we actually enable it. So on that one, we would enable the player by default. Then when we want to switch, we would disable the player, so just go into the player, call disable, and then go into player input actions, access the UI and call enable. So if you went with the C-sharp method, then this is what you would do. Now, something that I showed a while ago that is super useful is the input debugger. You go up here into window, then down here into analysis and open up the input debugger. And over here, it shows you all of the various connected devices. So for example, in my case, I've got a mouse, keyboard, I've got a DualShock and an Xbox controller. Then you can also see, for example, some unsupported devices. So for example, I recognize my microphone, but of course it's not a actual gamepad. Then I also recognize a bunch more. And my specific mouse isn't being recognized, but it is on the generic mouse. And then you can also double click on each of these to go even further. So for example, double click over here on the Xbox controller. Now, for example, if I press the A button, yep, you can see over there on the logs that it does recognize and I'll let go and it goes back into zero. So you can see up here on the value, the actual value that it's reading directly from there. So as I click, there you go, zero and so on. And if I move the D-pad, then you can see all the various directions. And if I touch on the left trigger, you can see, yep, the value going up and down and so on. So this is very useful to verify and make sure that your controller is indeed connected and Unity is indeed receiving the input correctly. So with this, we have the new input system working. One thing that is required in pretty much every game is rebinding keys. So let's see how that's done. Over here on the testing script, let's try rebinding the player jump action. So to do that, we access the same jump action, and then we call the function perform interactive rebinding. So this will essentially do what we saw of pressing the listen button. So you call this, this creates a specific object, and then you call start to actually start listening. So when you do, then it listens to the next input and assigns that to this action. However, just like this, we're going to get an error, but let's see it. And yep, there's the error. We cannot rebind something while something is currently enabled. So over here, we are enabling the player action map. So when we go to rebind, we need to make sure to disable. So first we disable, and then we start actually rebinding. So like I mentioned a while ago, we create the various action maps. So for example, one would be for the player in-game actions, and then another one for the UI inputs. And then while the UI input actions was enabled, then you could easily rebind the player input actions. Now this function, this one, the perform interactive rebinding, this actually returns an object of type rebinding operation. This object is what actually contains all of the data regarding the rebind. And then you can also add all kinds of modifiers in order to do various things before you actually call start. Specifically, it has an oncomplete event. So we can hook into this one in order to listen when the actual rebind completes. So for that, we perform the interactive rebinding, then instead of calling start right away, 
let's first call on complete. And on complete, this takes an action. So this one takes a callback as a parameter, so we can do it like this. So just a simple lambda expression. And in here, let's just do a debug log on the callback. Okay, now let's play the game. And that function was triggered on awake, so right now it is listening for a button. So as I press, for example, the T key, there you go, it actually worked, it rebound the key, but we also see an interesting error related to a native collection that was not disposed of. That is because you must manually dispose of this object in order to avoid any memory leaks. So the object is the actual rebinding operation. So that's the same one that we get over here on the callback. So on complete, we do this and then we can call dispose. So we dispose that and after the rebind completes, let's re-enable the action map so we try it out. So we re-enable this one and then let's see. Okay, so now it's listening to input. So as I press the T key, yep, now it should have rebound the jump action onto the T action. So if I press the space bar, nope, it no longer jumps. And if I press T, yep, now it does indeed jump. All right, great. Now, like I said, there's tons of filters you can apply in here. You can inspect the rebinding operation to see all of these various filters and things. So for example, you can add a canceling button or you can limit the expected control type. Or for example, you can limit some controls. So for example, you do with controls excluding, and then let's say excluding the mouse. So with this, I won't be able to rebind this action onto the mouse. So if I'm here and I click with the mouse, then nope, it's not rebinding because the mouse is not accepted. But if I press a different key on the keyboard, yep, there you go, now it does rebind. So with that, we can now rebind our actions. So I rebound this to the T key. So as I press T, it actually jumps. Okay, great. However, now if I stop playing the game and I start playing again, and I press the T key and nope, it's not jumping. It's once again, back to the default, back to the space. So naturally, we need to actually save the rebinds. And for that, there's actually two ways, depending on what version you're using. Now, if you're using version 1.0, then you need to manually save them. But if you're using version 1.1, then there's a much easier process. So when you actually rebind, so after the onComplete, it actually changes one thing in the asset. So for example, over here on the comeback, you can access the action. And then for each action, you've got various bindings. So you can cycle through this one, or in this case, we just have one, so just zero for testing. And then for each binding, you've got a field for the override path. So let's look at what this log, and as I press the T key to rebind, there you go, it did rebind in order to the keyboard T. So if you're using version 1.0, then this is what you need to do. You need to go through your input actions, go through all of the action maps, cycle through all of the bindings for each action, and save up the override path. However, if you're using version 1.1, then there is now a function to return some JSON for all of the overrides. So you just call this function and it returns a JSON string, which you can then easily save in a file or the player prefs or anything, and then another function for actual loading them. So depending on your version, you've got two different methods. Okay, so the last thing we need to cover are the touch controls. You can define the bindings like any other. So for example, if you look on the input actions that are created by default, on this one for the control schemes, you can see it does have a touch control scheme. And that one, you can see that it does have the very specific touch controls. So you can do this to set up the individual bindings. But beyond that, there's also a super useful built-in component. So here, let me make a canvas. And then inside the canvas, let me make an empty game object. And now inside, I'm going to add a UI image. And for the image, I'm going to select a basic circle. And I'll just take the stick and let's put it over here on the corner. And now on the image itself, we can add a component and search for on screen stick, this one. Then it's got two fields. So the movement range, that's how much this image is going to move relative to the parent. And then the control path, which is what this stick will simulate. So in this case, we can click on this. Let's go into the game pad and we're going to simulate the left stick. So if we play, now as I click and drag the virtual joystick, and yep, there you go, it is indeed moving the sphere. So it's moving in any direction, and if I push to the edge, then it's the 50 units that we saw there. So just like this, it is automatically working. And then the other built-in component, let's make another image, put it on the other side. And this one is the on-screen button. So this one, same thing, is just acts like a button. So let's pretend that this one is the gamepad south button. So as I click on this one, yep, it's simulating a jump. So for mobile, you can build your own UI from scratch and attach the touch-specific bindings, or you can use these super awesome, super useful built-in components. 
in order to simulate a gamepad using touch and everything else in your game won't work seamlessly. Alright, so that's a new input system package. This was a pretty big lecture since it's a pretty complex system, but hopefully you can see how the complexity does pay off. This system forces you to separate your logic and abstract actions away from physical inputs, which in turn leads to writing better, cleaner code and a game that can be played on any input device. Go watch the Input Manager vs Input System lecture if you haven't seen it yet in order to understand the differences, but if you're working on a proper game then this system is awesome and it's definitely what you should be using. Alright, so this was a lecture from my Ultimate Unity Overview course. There's lots more explaining tons of things like shader graph, assembly definitions, pro builder, the video player, and so on. Go ahead and get the full course and learn how to master all of the Unity tools and features to help you make better games faster. Alright, hope that's useful. Check out these videos to learn some more. Thanks to these awesome Patreon supporters for making these videos possible. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.